What a blessing to be in this house today to praise the Lord. Well, I'm in the process right now as you look at some pictures. I love this man. And Brother George, I'm going to invite you to come up, Pastor George Klein. He is married to his lovely wife of 48 years, Miss Beth. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Pastor George served uh, at Antioch Baptist Church right down the street from 1998 till June of 2021. And on that screen, you can see that uh, although he has retired from that church, he has not retired from the ministry. And that speaks volumes because the Lord has called each and every one of us until we take that last breath to continue to serve the Lord. And these are all the ministries that Pastor George is involved in, from the Georgia Baptist Intentional Interim Program uh, to the Disaster Relief Program. In fact, you just got back from South Georgia working. In fact, Jason was down there with you as well. He's also part of the Christian Motorcycle Association. And I thought it was fitting to put some motorcycle pictures up there. Uh, the little arrows point George out. What a blessing I had, as well as Gene somewhere in this place. Gene's in the back. Uh, we had the blessing to go to Sturgis and share Jesus Christ out at, uh, in Sturgis and Daytona a few times. Yeah. So um, uh, you can see we also had uh, Pastor George. He was helping us change the tire. He was the supervisor of that tire change out there in the Dakotas. And, uh, but what a blessing it was and it has been to not only be with him and to share Christ with him, but to know him as not only a brother in Christ, but a dear friend. So would you give Pastor George and his lovely wife Beth a warm welcome from Fellowship of the Hills. Thank you brother. Thank you. Well it is certainly a privilege to be here today when uh, Pastor Marty called and, and asked me if I would uh, come and help you celebrate your 15th uh, anniversary as a church I, I jumped all over it and, and I want to tell you why. Because Prior to this uh, Fellowship of the Hills getting started, uh, Marty came up, and I don't even think you, you and Susan had moved up here at that point, but you were coming and you were uh, visiting some churches, and he came to the church that I pastored, and uh, we had a few minutes to talk, and he talked about his vision and how he, wanted, he felt the Lord was leading him to start a church here. Now, I'm going to tell you, for some pa pastors who's already at an existing church, that makes them a little bit nervous. But I can tell you what. I welcomed it, and I would welcome it again because someone who's out doing the ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ, we need all the help we can get. Amen? Amen? And unfortunately, yeah, amen. Unfortunately, uh, in our county and in counties around us, there are churches that the doors are open, but there's no fire inside. Because they're just focused inward and they don't focus outward. Now, yes, we have to take care of people inside, but we also have to go outward. And that's what part of these ministries are about, is going out and going into our community and making a difference. If, if, if the statistics are true, 80% of people in Union County are not in church right now like you are. 80%. That's terrible. The truth of the matter is, if everybody in Union County was to show up for a Sunday morning service, we couldn't hold them all, Brother Pastor Marty. Couldn't hold them. Folks, we need to be about God's business. Amen? I want to, um, I want to share uh, uh, three different things with you uh, about the church. Your church has been doing it well. I know it will continue as you keep your heart focused on Jesus. Not anybody else. On Jesus. This is our time, so to speak, as Christians. The spiritual baton is in our hands. And while we're here, and while we're on this earth, and while we have this opportunity uh, uh, to share the gospel, we need to be doing it. If you know anything about track and field, you know they have relay races. And in the relay races, one runner comes up, and that person, he or she's got a baton in their hand, and they have to hand it as they're running to the next person who's also started running. And they carry it for a while, and on and on. And every generation has that spiritual baton, so to speak. And we need to be busy about that. See, one of the greatest sins in the Christian life, I believe, is a sin of omission. You say, what's the sin of omission? It's not doing, not doing what God has told us to do. 
And that's what we're going to look at today. There are three important areas of ministry I want to, I want to look at. Three things that God has made crystal clear. We don't have any excuse whatsoever for not doing them. I didn't get an amen on that. <laughs> Maybe I'll let them seek in a little bit. By the way, that is only water. Just for the record. But I want us to focus on some things that Christ has made crystal clear that Christians should be involved in if we're going to be in God's will for our life. And the first one I want us to look at is the Great Commission. We need to be committed to the Great Commission. Now, I know you've heard it many times, but folks, I want us to understand something. Do you remember when the fires uh, in, uh, in Hawaii on Maui uh, took off? You remember? You remember how the, how the wind got behind it? And it kept pushing that fire. Do you know when that fire stopped? When it ran out of something to burn. That's the truth. When it ran out of something to burn. And folks, as Christians, as a church without a heart for the Great Commission, it's a contradiction in terms uh, to not be on fire for Christ. Folks, we need to be active. We need to be involved. Now listen to the Great Commission. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to read verses 16 through 20. You've heard it many times, I'm sure. Some of you may have it memorized, and I hope you do. But I want to encourage you to take a look at it. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Now I just do this in my church. I want you to stand in honor of God's holy word as I read his word. We're just, we will just do this on the first uh, passage, but I want us to to realize this is God's holy word. If you believe that, say amen. amen. This is what he said, starting in verse 16, Matthew chapter 28. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You may be seated. Folks, this is, this is our marching orders. It's impossible. It's impossible for, gener for, uh, for that generation to reach everybody. It's impossible for our generation to reach everybody. But while we're here, while we're on this earth, while we claim to be Bible-believing Christians, while we say that we know that we're supposed to be doing the things God told us to do, are we actually doing them? Are you involved? If you're a born-again believer, when you got saved... The Holy Spirit came upon you and gave you spiritual gifts. And you're to be using that spiritual gift, whatever it is. And as long as you're using those spiritual gifts, it may be teaching, it may be preaching, it may be witnessing, it may be taking care of the nursery, it may be uh, cleaning, it may be serving, it could be uh, leading a uh, Bible study, whatever. It could be anything. But whatever that spiritual gift is that God has given you, we need to be busy doing it. Nobody has an excuse not to. Nobody. Now, uh, um, we have this time, and we're to reach out to people. You know, Jesus was telling his disciples, this is what you're to do. Here's a baton. Go do it. Okay? And we're to do the same thing. This very charge God gave to them then, He has given to us now, and will be given to generations to follow. Jesus' spiritual baton was placed in the disciples' hands. And He just told them very simply, go and make disciples, teach them to deserve all the things I've commanded you. Folks, there's no guesswork to this. We don't have to wonder what to do. Some, I've, I've heard people say for years, well, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. Read the book. Years ago, when I was uh, in college, uh, Georgia State, graduated from Georgia State University, business degree many years ago, and, um, and it was an economics course, 
And we had taken this test, and they came back, and everybody had blown it. The highest grade was a 59. The highest grade was a 59. The professor took the book. He said, everybody got their book with them? Yep. Hold your book up. Held the book up. If all else fails, read it. Try reading it. If all else fails, read it. Amen? Stop and think about it. He, he told us what to do. And when he talks about making disciples, what is he talking about doing? He's talking about doing the same thing that Jesus had demonstrated to his disciples. Now, we wasn't there physically, but we have his holy word. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I make no excuses, no exceptions. To me, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, this is God's holy word. No exceptions, no excuses. And to use a phrase that I heard a guy say one time, shut up and do it. Hello? Amen. Shut up's not really a church word, is it? <laughs> Somebody back here must have said that. I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> What'd you say, Dan? They, they relate to shut up. Oh, I ain't going there. But uh, Jesus came to, to seek and to save, and that's what we're to do. What did Jesus do? His disciples came, and, and, they, and, and he took them, and he demonstrated how you talk to people. He demonstrated on how you care about people. He shared life with them. He shared ministry with them. He taught them what the mission mandate was, what the ministry mandate was. He made them aware of his mission, his method, his obsession, and to make disciples. In simple terms, that's what the Lord did. And Jesus knew that if we accepted those things and began to do them, that people would come to know the Lord as their Savior and start being involved in ministry. Now, does everybody do that? No. Didn't end well for Judas, did it? Now, Peter made a serious mistake, no doubt about it. He denied Christ three times. But Peter repented and got back in and became a great apostle for Jesus Christ. Amen? A great leader, and we can, we can learn from him. Jesus, the fact is that Jesus said to go indicates that he's given us an offensive directive, and that is to go and make disciples. You know, I know I'm not the only one in here that likes football or, or any other sport, but you have to have, on a football team, you have to have an offensive team, just like you have to have a def defensive team. You have to have special teams. The, de the <clears throat> defense can get out there all day long, but they're not going to score enough points to win the game. The offense has got to get out there and take the ball and do something with it. Amen? Now, um, I don't even want to uh, go down that road. I, I, I thought about saying some things about, um, about some football teams, but um, I realized I'd probably get in trouble quick. And since this is not solid all the way through and you can get stuff through it, I'm afraid you might throw something at me. But um, just kidding, of course, just kidding. We're to be involved. We're to accomplish making disciples by training them, by teaching them, by demonstrating to them. That's why more spiritually mature people ought to take someone who's not too spiritually mature and let them see life. Doing ministry, witnessing, sharing your faith. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely every ministry, everything we do should be involved in teaching people about Jesus Christ in some way and what he did. And then duplicating that. Your mission begins in your home and then you work outward from that. Some stay in the community. Some go to different states. Some go to different continents. Some go, uh, you know, just all over the world. But we're to be busy doing what Christ told us to. Everything we do must be motivated by the life of Christ and his love for us. How can you repay somebody? Anybody answer me this question? If you come up with it, write it down, and hand it to me on the way out this morning. How can you repay somebody who died for you? How can you do that? Now, everybody here would say they would die for their child. Hopefully die for their spouse. Man, <laughs> they had a good week, okay? Just kidding. 
Marty told me to say that. No. <laughs> no I wouldn't blame that on anybody. That was just foolish. But anyway, no, we would die for those we love. We would die for those that we care for. We think we would. We would like to think we would. We might not ever know until we really got in that situation. But Jesus Christ died for us when he knew what we were going to do. If you knew that someone was going to betray you, someone's going to lie about you, somebody's going to misrepresent you, somebody's going to steal from you, someone's going to try and do something to destroy you, would you still die for them? And if we're all honest, we'd probably say no. But Jesus did. Jesus, can you grasp that thought? That's our motivation. His great love for us. And, and we ought to love him and others. And we're going to get that into the minute. In, in just, <clears throat> excuse me, in just a minute. Remember, Jesus, uh, his perfect promise, he says, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus made a commitment to those who, who understood, who responded, who accepted the invitation to do ministry with them. And this, this morning, i got to ask you, are you obedient enough to do that? Do you care enough to be obedient to what Jesus tells us to do? In 2 Peter, <clears throat> excuse me, in second, I spent all day at the soccer field yesterday and this whatever, I got it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it states it this way. It says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If every person matters to God, then that person should matter to us. Now, I saw the clip last night, or excuse me, this morning, about Israel and the tragic there. Even the people that gave the order to pull the trigger or push the button, whatever they do with missiles. I've never even been around one. But anyways, to shoot that missile that sent, sent in and killed, what you said, 400 people, I believe, thousands more injured, that person needs Jesus too. I don't want that person to die without knowing Christ as their Savior. Now, I can get mad about it and get mad at what they did, totally 100% what they did. Don't agree with it. But even the worst terrorists on the planet, get a grip. Jesus died for that person too. Now, we can, we're, we're human. We get mad. And if I had a son who was a soldier, I did have one. He's out of the military now. He served his time. But if I had a son who's in the danger zone, I'd be real concerned. And we need to pray for our military. We need to pray for the decision. The people that are meeting probably right now as we speak, trying to figure out what their next step is, what the plan is, we need to lift them up in prayer. And thank you so much for praying for them this morning. Thank you. Because we need to pray for them. And we need to pray for the safety of our troops and for the wisdom that the generals use. I want us to understand that Jesus was willing to give it all for us. We ought to be willing to give our all for him. And he's placed that spiritual baton in our hand. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Folks, we need to be committed to the Great Commission. Second thing I want you to see is we need to be committed to the Great Commandment. Uh, if you take your Bibles, turn to uh, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And I'm going to read just three verses there. And this is a time Jesus was teaching and people were asking questions. And in Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28, it says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reason together, perceived that he had answered them well when asked, What is the first commandment of all? And some of your versions will say, what is the greatest commandment of all? Jesus answered, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 30, 
And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the, but he didn't stop there. And it's important that he didn't stop there. Because he went on to the second one. And in verse 31 it says, And the second like it is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love is something that, that God has given us the privilege of doing. Now it's easy to love our children. It's easy to love our grandchildren. Beth and I are blessed with eight grandchildren. And uh, when they're all at the house at one time, I call them the eight little tornadoes coming through the house. But uh, because nothing's ever the same after they leave. And if you're a grandparent, you know what I'm talking about. And you just kind of let it go. And you feel, realize you've got another week to clean up after them. But anyways. <laughs> we love our kids. We love our grandkids. For some of you, great-grandparents. We love people in our family. We love people in our church. We love, the, we love leaders. We love servers. We love, we, just, we love people. But there are some people that are very hard to love, but Jesus tells us that we need to do it. And, it, and this is what he's talking about is an extreme kind of love. You remember a few years back, there was a program called on the TV, a series called Extreme Sports. Now, these were sports that were not normal. And they were extreme and be in danger, be in hard, something like that. There is also a show called uh, Extreme Makeovers. That's where it could be a man, could be a woman, could be a couple. They used to live in one way and dressing one way and having certain habits. And they come in and someone completely gives them a makeover and you don't even recognize them. That's kind of what God does with us. He takes a lost soul and he makes something beautiful out of it. But we got to be willing to do it. So with, with all these extremes, and there are other extreme programs out there, but I want to give you something this morning that's even more extreme than any sport you can imagine. It's not a sport. You don't have to pay your medical insurance up before you start it, okay? It's the truth that God loves you. And no matter who you are or what you've done or, or, or what you've been through, <clears throat> God loves you. And God does require that you love him and love others as yourself. Now, we could say, okay, it's easy to love God because of what he's done for us. It's easy to love other people. We would really like to chop off about the last three words where it says, love others as you love yourself. Because I've heard people say, oh, I love them. I don't like them, but I love them. You know, I, I wish they were further off. I could love them from afar better than I can when I'm around them. No one ever wants to bring harm on themselves, as a rule. Nobody wants to bring harm on themselves. I'm not talking about, you know, suicide issues. I'm talking about people, as a rule, they want the very best for themselves. And when, when God says to love other people, as yourself, you only want other people to do good things to you, to respect you, to care about you, even as people you don't know, meeting a restaurant, meeting Walmart, wherever. You want to show, you want, you want to be shown respect, and we need to show respect. You want to be loved, and you, we've got to love other people. And some people are very hard to love. It's hard to love terrorists. It's hard to love the people who gave the orders to do what they did in Israel yesterday. But God tells us we're to love them. That doesn't mean we endorse them. It does not mean we go along with what they're saying. It does not mean, <clears throat> and we have abused this word of tolerance, okay? We've abused that word to where tolerance to most people means you need to accept what I do. No, no. Not if it's against God's word. God's word's clear what sin is. We don't have to guess at it. That's the thing that, 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 that gets me with some people. Their spiritual growth is stopped because they claim they don't know what sin is sometimes. I'm not going to go through and read the list. In Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, 
through the end of the chapter, God lists 28, 29 different sins, and it covers the whole gamut. It's the most thorough list of sins that there is in the Bible, right there in Romans chapter 1, 18, through the end of the chapter. And you read through that. Am I doing any of these things? If you are, you've got some repenting to do. It amazes me how someone will point out somebody else's sin when they themselves are doing it, but they point it out in somebody else. We've got to clean our own house up, don't we? And we've got to do what's right in God's eyes. Listen, <clears throat> God loves you. He doesn't care what has happened in the past. He can change you. And He wants you to love Him and love other people. Jesus gave His all for us. And that's why He talks about in the Scripture that you were to love Him. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry for my voice. Forgive me. Um, with your whole heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. That heart represents your place of passion. The soul represents your eternal being and the seat of your emotions. Your mind represents your thoughts and your reasoning. And the body or, or strength, whichever version, uh, whichever word your version uses, means it's talking about your physical strength. God wants you to love Him with your whole heart. With your whole being. Now, what's Satan going to do? He's going to do everything he can to throw you off course. Listen, get a grip on this. Those 28, 29 sins that I referred to in Romans chapter 1, he doesn't care which one you... Satan, Satan doesn't care which one you use. He doesn't care what you're involved in because in order to be involved in those, you're going to break your fellowship with God. Okay? Not the relationship, but the fellowship. Satan will try anything... To prevent you from loving God. He wants to remind you of your sin. He wants to convict you of your sin. He wants to tell you that, hey, uh, God told you not to do that. You did it anyways, and you keep doing it over and over and over again. You need to turn around and run away from God. No, we need to run towards God. Amen. God can clean us up. I don't know about you, but I need a spiritual shower every now and then. Amen? And, I don't, and I'm not the only one. Listen, we're going to let God down. We're going to make mistakes. But just as Peter made a terrible mistake, King David made a terrible mistake. But they handled it correctly. They confessed. They repented. And they changed their ways. And whatever you're dealing with today, whatever happened last week, God can change that. You don't have to obey Satan. When he dangles that carrot of your favorite sin, whatever that may be, don't turn to him. You don't run away from God, you run away from Satan. You say, Satan, get behind me. And you command him in, in the name of Jesus, and he'll have to, and he, he has to, but he's not going to stay gone long. It's a constant spiritual battle. But we have the power of Almighty God at our source. We ha Do you get that? We have the power of Almighty God. Nothing is more powerful than God. And He says He wants to be with us. He says He, says he wants to help us. And we need to understand that, that. That He provides that. God loves us. Understand that when He asked about the, about the greatest commandment, he proceeded to talk about, here again, loving God and loving others. It's interesting that, that love for God and others is a command. You would think love comes naturally. Do you know my grandkids did not have to command me to love them? It comes natural. Even when you might want to kind of get them in a vice sometimes. I know none of y'all grandparents have ever done that. So let me tell you, it happens. Not to physically do it, but maybe even to think it. I will never forget first grandchild. She's about one and a half, two years old, getting to where she can walk real good. She's smart. She loved playing with uh, things. And uh, I was watching the football game. Terrible time to interrupt Grandpa, but anyways. <laughs> just kidding. 
Just kidding. It's all right to laugh and have fun in God's house. Amen. Is that right, preacher? Now, she, 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 she's little. And she comes up, and I'm sitting there on the couch, and the remote control is sitting right there. And she walks over, and she picks it up, and she looks at it, and I saw that finger. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 Jacqueline. No, no, no. Here, let, let Papa have that. And I took it, and I set it back down. And she looked at me, and she, I kind of got back watching, and, and, and she picked it up again. And I kind of turned her around a little bit, and I looked her right in the eyes and said, Jacqueline, no. And she used her most, her strongest weapon. <laughs> she looked at me and started to tear up. And I felt like the baddest dog in the room, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you. But with all of that, with all of that, we have to understand that no matter what mistakes we make, God gives us another chance. And, 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 and when people do things wrong, to, and they are. Why are, we, why are we surprised when someone does something we don't want them to do? Especially, and it's directed towards us. Why are we surprised at that? They're human. They're going to do it. And they may not mean to. Or maybe they intentionally do mean to. If you've been married more than about three days, <laughs> oh, I'm going to be gracious this morning, seven days. And I may be the only person in the room, Beth and I, but we've had a disagreement or two over our days, over 48 years. Going to be 49 in just a couple months if she doesn't kill me first. <laughs> Debbie, hold her back, okay? <laughs> You're going to have disagreements. Husbands, wives are going to disagree. Children uh, are certainly going to disagree with their parents especially those teenage years. Amen. I like what one comedian said one time. It was a pretty serious statement, but uh, he, he said it as a comedian for, and for a laugh. He said, grandchildren are God's blessings for not killing our kids when they were little. You know, <laughs> and um, but what, let, me, let me get back to this. I don't want to... Uh, Marty said I had plenty of time. He said supper's not till five o'clock, so, you know... <laughs> You know, you know, anyways, we don't think of love as a command, but, but it is a command. For us, you know, love is something we value. It may be talking about a sports team or, or an activity or, or, or motorcycles or golf or, or basket weaving or whatever, but it's something we value. And when we speak it, we say, may say that we love it or we may love a certain type of food or clothing or something. It's something we value. For us, love is something that is emotional, but our emotions change from time to time. But for God, love is essential. Love is His nature. He, why does God love? Because He is love. Scripture tells us that. And every child of God, uh, he, he gives that love to them for, for help. Now listen, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint us because... The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So certainly, uh, God's love has been poured out in our hearts, and we need to express that to other people. It's kind of strange for us to think of it, because for us, it's an emotion, it's, a, it's a, a, something we can do, something we want to do in many cases. But for God, it's essential. Therefore, who else is it essential to? All of us. All of us. Now, the government, uh, can, now there can be laws. The government can make laws. As a matter of fact, government's made a law that we have to pay our taxes. But I bet you here there's not, there's not anyone that loves doing it. Amen? And that's just one silly example. But with God, it's different. Our love for God must be at the root of obeying all His laws. If we don't love Him, if we don't appreciate Him for what He's done, we're not going to do what He says. 
Jesus says, as I have loved you, you should love one another. Why is this important to obey God's love to command? Because when we love God and others, we recognize who God is. I don't know about you. I believe 100% that he is totally the God who created the universe, who created us, who gives you and me right now the ability to breathe and be here. He can take it away like that. He can take it away that quick. And we never know. But he loves us and he wants us in this relationship. We should love others because not because they deserve it or because they meet our approval, but because we are loved by God and we want to be obedient to Him. <clears throat> in John 14, 21, Jesus taught us this. He says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I like that idea of manifesting himself to us. You know what that means? Two wonderful benefits. We have the presence of God with us. We have the presence of the Lord, the presence of the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. And, and the Lord loves us. He wants us to experience his love, and he wants us to share that with other people. The presence of God with us but also the power of God with us. Back in the Great Commission, it says he has all authority at the beginning, and at the end he says, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Everything in between that happens, God is there with his presence and with his power. If we'll plug into it and use it, you've got... Really nice instruments up here, microphone system. You know, you got the screens. You had a good electrical system here. Temperature's just right. Wait a minute, that's impossible. That's the biggest debate in any church is the temperature. Just kidding. But if all the power went out and the temperature was in here right now, like it was at my house this morning, which is 41 degrees, we'd be uncomfortable, wouldn't we? But if we're plugged into the power source, we have the power to operate the heating and air, electrical systems, all that kind of stuff. Folks, why don't we plug in on a spiritual basis? Why do we struggle with that so much? Why is that such an issue? You've built a great church here. You're having an impact on this community. You are doing... What God said to do. Are you perfect at it? No, because you're imperfect people. Where I pastored, were we perfect at it? No, we're imperfect people there. But we have the power of God to plug into His resources, to experience His presence, to experience His power, and accomplish the things that He wants to accomplish. But you know what? Some people don't do those things because they don't, they don't hear and understand what he wants them to do. And, and God's not going to give that, um, give them the ability to hear his voice if he knows he's wasting his time, so to speak. Listen to John chapter 8. And I'm going to read verses 43 through 45. <clears throat> John chapter 8, starting in verse 43. Jesus is talking. And he says, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You and your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which, and he's talking about what he had just said. Verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Listen to verse 47. 
He who is of God hears God's words, and therefore you do not hear talking to the ones he was talking to then, because you are not of God. God makes himself available for us to hear what he wants us to do. Now, he speaks to us in a lot of different ways, and that's a sermon for another day. I'm not going to get into it. This is the greatest source right here. He's given us his word. We don't have to go write a manual. This is the manual. The only manual. And we're to be busy doing what he tells us to do. And, and, and it really is that simple. We try to make it a lot harder. You say, well, how do you, I want to love God. How do I love God? First thing you have to do, you have to look at your sin. We have to admit that we're sinners. There's no one in here that is not a sinner. Now, I've had people get mad at me for saying that before, but I'm a big boy and I can take it, so that's okay. We're all sinners, according to God's word. We all make mistakes. If we were not sinners, we'd be perfect. We'd be like Jesus. We're not like Jesus. We try to be like Jesus, and we don't want to sin, and we don't use that as an excuse, but we have to look at our sins, and we have to deal with them as God tells us to. And that is to confess those, repent of them, and do the very best we can to get back in God's will for our life and do the right thing. But we also have to look at his sacrifice. It isn't enough just to remember that he had saved us. We need to remember what he went through to save us. Dying on that cold, hard, cruel cross. And by the way, the crosses of that day was not nice and smooth like this is. There were splinters sticking out. All kind of problems with it. And and when we think about the cross and the suffering servant and the sacrifice, we're called to love him and to, and to labor for him. And think of what he did for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. Listen to what it says. It states it this way. <clears throat> for the love of Christ compels us. And he died for all, that those who shall live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. Isn't that motivation enough to be in God's will? To do our best to be in God's will? Also, we have to look at our service for others. And this is something we overlook sometimes. 2 Corinthians 8.8. 8. I'm going to read that to you in just a second. Look at spiritually mature people around you. Learn from them. See Jesus in them. Become one of them. You may be the only person in your family that attends church. You may be the only person in your family that makes any effort whatsoever to show love and, and respect and obedience to God. And it's easy when you're around all those other family members or friends or maybe in a civic club or whatever, whatever the case may be, and you see all kind of activity except godly activity. Folks, you're in the darkness. That's your time to shine. Let your light shine for Jesus Christ. And to stand up against that. I'm not going to say that some sin is all right. And if somebody wants to call me a bigot or a racist, they can do that. I'm a big boy. I can take it. I want God to call me by name. I'm not worried about what they call me. I'm not going to say that some sin is okay. You're not the exception to the rule. I have, in my 30 years of ministry, I have people come in for counseling. They sit across from me, and they tell me their sin, and they say, I only did mine because of what he or she did. Like, it's okay because somebody else did it. No, it's not okay. We're one-on-one. One-on-one. And we can't get away from that. But look at, the, look at people who are strong, faithful Christians. Listen to what it says in... 2 Corinthians 8.8. 8. I hope it gets your attention. Now, Paul's talking to the Corinthians uh, about how some of the believers were giving long service to the Lord and asked others to take a look at their lives. And here's what he says. I speak not my commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. You're looking at people who are spiritually mature. These uh, men and, and staff and women that are up here, 
uh, this morning that Marty called up and had prayer for. Folks, you need to lift them up in prayer. Whoever's teaching your Bible study, you need to lift them up in prayer. Whoever's leading your small group, whoever is doing anything in the way of ministry and leading that, you need to lift them up in prayer on a regular basis because Satan's attacking them. You can guarantee it. He absolutely will. Christians should, should test the sincerity of our love against that of other people. I'm going to end this section with this one illustration. It was when North Korea was taken over by the communists. And the communists did not, did not like Christianity. And so uh, there was uh, Christians and churches in North Korea at that time. And so the soldiers rounded up all the people who claimed to be Christians and told them to go to their church. There were soldiers waiting for them at the church. They went to the church, and this one particular church had a picture of Jesus up on the wall. And the soldier went over and took that picture of Jesus and threw it down on the floor. And he said, every one of you who does not come up and spit on this picture of this man in this frame, you'll be shot. What would you do? The first four people that got up, walked up, spit on the picture of Jesus. They were able to go free. The fifth person was a young woman, went up. She didn't spit on Jesus' picture. She didn't spit on Jesus' picture. She knelt down, picked the picture up, wiped the sweat off his picture onto her clothes and just held it and said, Jesus, I love you no matter what. They took her outside. We heard gunshots. She was dead. That's love for the Savior. He sacrificed for us. And she had to... Now, most of us will never be in that type of situation. <laughs> At least we think. Sometimes I wonder if what's going on in politics now. Amen? And I don't want to get on that bandwagon today. That's a, a, a sermon. Not one sermon. That's a sermon series for another day. But anyways, th this girl, the issue was not that the girl was concerned about the desecration of a sacred object. It was the love for the person that it represented. Let me move on. I need to, uh, time really is, is getting away. And I want to look at the third thing. First of all, we need to be committed to the Great Commission. We need to be committed to the Great Commandment. And the third thing I want to sh see, share with you this morning is we need to be committed to unity in prayer. Now, turn back to 1 John chapter 3 with me, if you would. 1 John chapter 3. And I'm going to read that in just a minute, but I want us to understand something. When it comes to prayer, there are hundreds of scriptures I could ask you to turn to. 1 John chapter 3, it's not up there. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 21. I'm just going to read about three verses, but there's so many passages of scripture on prayer that could be used, and you, and you know a lot of those. But I'm going to use this one. Because uh, prayer is the most talked about but yet least practice thing in the Christian life. You say, what? Oh, yeah. Prayer is the most talked about, but the least practiced aspect of the Christian life. An honest evaluation of our lives will confirm that truth. Hey, we talk about prayer. We talk about prayer. We study prayer. We read about prayer. We tell people we should pr that, that they should pray. We should pray. We want pre people to pray. We believe in prayer. But do you know that the sad fact is that most Christians don't really get around to serious prayer? Now, let me define that as serious prayer. When you go and you're going to leave here and you can go to maybe a restaurant or home and, and you're going to uh, uh, pray and thank God for the food. And you should. You should. Especially in a restaurant. It's a time for your light to shine. Amen? Wow. All right, I'm going to say that again. I'm going to give you a second chance. When you pray in public, not make a big spectacle, nothing like that, not put on a show. Sincerely bow your head and just thank God for the food. Amen? That's the time for your light to shine. Listen, 
Wow. I got till five, right? (laughs) The light of a Christian should dispel the darkness. We should. Don't be afraid to pray in public. There is a restaurant in, I don't know if it's the southern part of Fannin County or if it's where Lumpkin County where they come together, but it's in a resort kind of area that will not let you pray with their waitresses or, or waiters. And they don't even encourage prayer. Supposedly, one guy that we were with, we were just out uh, motorcycle riding. We stopped at this restaurant. It's a beautiful setting on the river. And we went in, and uh, we placed our order. And right before we, uh, one of the guys said, uh, listen, we're about to pray and thank God for our food. And, and when, when we said that, this lady, this young lady, very bright, very pleasant young lady up to that point, dropped her head like that. And she said, we can't do that here. And she turned and walked away. And I said, well, we can. <laughs> and, and we prayed. And, and we didn't create a scene. It's, you're not there to create a scene. You're there because you want to thank God that he's blessed you with the ability to have a plate of food set in front of you. Amen? But there are places like that. We have got to remember that how powerful, how powerful prayer is. I mentioned earlier, I welcomed the opportunity to come today because of the history of your pastor and your church here. There are churches in this county that I would not feel that same way towards because they are dying on the vine of self. No other way to say it. They're dying on the vine of self. They're not about the Lord's business. Oh, they come in, they'll sing a few songs. Somebody will say a few words. They have no part of ministry. They don't invite people to church. They don't share their faith with anybody. They don't share a gospel track with anybody. They don't go out into the community like Nick was talking about this morning, how y'all go out into the community. And, but now there are other churches that do, but there's a lot that don't, unfortunately. At the last count, there was like 72 churches that I was, that I was aware of. This was a couple years ago in Union County. There's only a few that are actively involved in the community. And the rest, while they may be teaching to themselves and keeping to themselves, they're not reaching out into the community. You can't be true to the Great Commission and keep to yourself. Amen? Am I right, Pastor Monty? Because of that, is there any wonder that there's lack of uh, 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 victory in churches? Any power in their experience? Any persuasiveness in their witness? Can there be any other reason than the, than the pure, pure absence of prayer in their lives? I want to I give you a, a couple of examples. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. First, how long has it been? Listen carefully. I always walk to this side. Let me walk to this side. <laughs> Marty might need to hear this. No, I'm just kidding. He'll never ask me back. It's nice seeing y'all. <laughs> How long has it been since you changed your schedule to take time to kneel down and spend serious time in prayer with God? You have things on the calendar. Your cell phone, you pop it up, got plenty for you to do. How long has it been when God lays something on your heart and you know you need to pray about it and you think, oh, I'll do that later? When you change your schedule to kneel down and be obedient and pray to God about that issue or for that person or whatever the case may be, how long has it been? Who sets our schedule? Satan would love to. Satan will keep you busy. And some of the things will actually... As the world looks at it, it would be considered good things. But we need to be busy about what God does and and, and adhere to God's schedule. Amen? 
We need to spend time kneeling before God in prayer. And unfortunately, many people just walked away from it. <clears throat> how long? <clears throat> excuse me. How long has it been um, since you prayed with the confidence of George uh, Mueller, who sought God alone for the financial resources to take care of thousands of orphans? How um, how long has it been since you prayed? with the consistency of a Hudson Taylor who founded the Great China Inward uh, Mission, who claimed that the sun never rose over China without him being on his knees in prayer. He prayed early every morning, the sun come up. Or what about the effectiveness of John Hyde, missionary to India, who at the end of his life, listen to this one, Marty, at the end of his life, an old man, he was leading four people a day to the Lord. Wow. That blows our mind. I mean, it really does. What about the energy of David uh, uh, Bernard, who, even though he was sick, he prayed because of where he was at. He prayed in knee-deep snow for hours sometimes. And he had the privilege of seeing one of the greatest movement of God in the history of the North American continent. When's the last time you prayed like that? How long has it been since you really prayed as if your life depended on it? I guarantee you, if, if someone that you love dearly was in a hospital, maybe they had a surgery, and this surgery was very low chance of succeeding, which means they were, would not survive it. And there are surgeries like that, unfortunately. Marty and I have been beside the bed in hospitals of people in that situation. How long has it been since you prayed as if your life depended on it? That's how we should. Amen? That's how we should. You know, the Jews of the Old Testament and New Testament, they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And we as Christians, we do not reject Jesus as Messiah. We accept him as a Messiah. But we seem to reject Jesus' teaching on being united in prayer. We need to have personal prayer time, but we need to have community prayer time too. And the sad fact is, how many, I'm going to ask you this question. How many churches do you know of in this county or wherever you're from? You may be visiting today and never stepped foot in Union County before, but you wanted to go to the church and you were going down the road, <coughs> excuse me, and you, um, and you saw this church and you decided to stop. How many churches do you know of wherever you live that has an organized prayer meeting. That meeting is set up to come in and pray. And you might have a list of uh, the, uh, the blessings that's happened in the church, a uh, list of uh, needs uh, or other prayer concerns. It may be uh, a, a, a lot of different things that you could pray for. And then, now, I know people that will go to those, and, and we had one throughout my ministry, every church I've been at, and you're going to have it if I ever pastor another one again. I, that's not the plan. God's got me in different directions right now. But um, I mean an organized prayer meeting where people come and they actually pray out loud. Ladies and gentlemen, don't throw the hymnals. Y'all don't have hymnals, do you? I'm safe. If we can't come together in God's house and lifting up prayers to God on behalf of somebody else. And we can't do that and we, we're too ashamed to pray in front of other people. What does that say about our spiritual life? We are so concerned about what somebody else will think. Well, I know I'll mess up prayers in my life and I probably will again. But I'm not concerned about what other people think. I'm concerned what God hears, what God knows, what God is seeing me do. See, we're accountable to Him. We're not accountable to anybody else. I mean, do you really realize that? We're not accountable. That spiritual baton of prayer is in your hand. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Now, even, even though Christians don't reject Christ as the Messiah... But we seem to reject Jesus' teaching on being united in prayer. 
And, and, you know, you might say, well, preacher, how in the world do you figure that? It's just because of the lack of prayer in our community. To my knowledge, there is only three actual prayer meetings that take place where people come together for the purpose of prayer. Now, I'm not talking about coming into a room and sitting down. And yes, the idea is to pray. And um, you may have a list. You may not have a list. Uh, but you come in and you talk. you got an hour. Okay? You talk for 55 minutes. And then somebody prays for two or three minutes. I mean, when people honestly get down on their either hands and knees or sit wherever they are around the table, it doesn't matter. It's not about the position. It's about the person we're focused on and being obedient to His Word. How many times... How many people, how many places do you know like that? I know of three. Folks, we say we believe in prayer. We say we want prayer. People ask us to pray and we say we will. Do we? We study about it. Why do we neglect it so much? The God of the universe gave us the privilege to come and talk to him in prayer. And we blow it off, it's like it's nothing. What are you doing with that spiritual baton? I could go on and on, I'm not going to. A lot of people uh, have cop-outs for prayer. You know, why they don't pray. Some say prayer doesn't work. They prayed for something one time. God didn't either give it to them or do something for them, so they said prayer doesn't work. No use, no one's going to do it. There are some people who uh, they don't pray because they feel it conflicts with the, <clears throat> their understanding of the natural law, and their argument says that everything's already set in motion. Prayers can't have any effect on what's happening in the world, so there's no use. That God is locked into the system. Oh, no, He's not. God is the system, He created the universe. He rules the universe. He made the universe. And to believe in an omnipotent God means to believe that in any situation, God can act in any way He chooses. Amen? Also, some people say that prayer is a cop-out. That's only just for weak-minded people who won't take any other action so they go through a time of prayer. No, that's not the answer, my friend. Let me tell you something. Prayer is never a substitute for action. It is the empowerment for more effective action. Amen? Almost done. A <clears throat> couple examples. And all of these were people, with the exception of Christ, that were standing against uh, an in an unbelievable situation. Moses prayed and then went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Joshua prayed <clears throat> and then he led Israel to war against the inhabitants of Canaan. Daniel prayed, or excuse me, David prayed, and then he sunk a stone in the forehead of Goliath. By the way, David wasn't concerned about the strength of Goliath. You know why? Because he knew the strength of his God. Amen? Amen. Nehemiah prayed, and then he mobilized the people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Jesus prayed, and prayed and then he faced the reality of Calvary. The disciples prayed and then he went to the streets to uh, they went to the streets to proclaim the message of a resurrected Lord. Prayer was never meant to be a substitute for action, but a source of power for effective action. Now I want to read this first uh, John chapter three, starting in verse twenty one. Beloved, if our hearts <clears throat> excuse me, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. The power is there. We just have to tap into it. We have to believe God is who He says He is and do what He said to do. Listen, excuses don't work, faith works. We have to understand that. 
What's more important than prayer? Absolutely nothing. Just think about the great privilege of of, of praying and approaching the God of the universe. You know, uh, Luke in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, talks about when he's talking about the, uh, the building of the New Testament church, that prayer time was one of the most vital parts of it. Peter Marshall uh, made this statement. Forgive us for thinking prayer is a waste of time and help us to see that without prayer, our work is a waste of time. Amen? There's power in prayer and there's no limit to what God can do. Do you know, according to God's word, now we all know the story of Job. We know the terrible experience he went through. We knew he, know about his relationship. Do you know that Job prayed when everything was good? But Job also prayed when everything was bad. What an example. What an example. Amen? If we, uh, uh, Scripture tells us, if we ask anything according to His will, He hears it. And He'll do If it's in his his will. I don't know about you, but there's things I prayed for in my past. Praise God they did not come true. Amen? I mean, they were selfish prayers. They were stupid. There's that word again. I don't know. They were stupid prayers. They were self-centered prayers. Praise God he didn't answer them. He knows better. I don't know about you, but when I go over Blood Mountain, that'll increase your prayer life. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble on this one. As a joke, we took the grandkids last week to uh, Dollywood. Dollywood. And the two oldest ones are big enough to where they can ride any roller coaster out there. And one of them absolutely loves loves roller coasters. There's a couple of them roller coasters there. I was praying one of them would be shut down, and it was for a while. I didn't pray long enough because the time I got up there, and it was going. So we go through it. But they got a couple that you know, they go really fast, flips you up and down, all that kind of stuff. And got, <laughs> and got off, and a friend from church called me and said, what you doing? I said, oh, well, I'm up here with grandkids. And just got off the roller coaster. He said, if you rode that, I think they call it a lightning head or, or something like that. I don't know what it was. And man, that thing flips you upside down. It goes about 60 miles an hour. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, if, you, if you had any loose change in your pocket, it would be out somewhere along the way. Maybe that's how they make their money. I don't know. But, he, <laughs> <laughs> but he said, he said uh, how can you take that? And I said, really, I've got, I've got an answer for that. Oh, I'm in trouble. I said, before I go on roller coasters, I let Beth drive me over Blood Mountain, and I'm ready after that point. <laughs> Marty, will you lay hands on her? <laughs> I may need to go home for lunch with somebody else today. And I was just kidding. Beth's an excellent. She's a better driver than I am. I can't believe I admitted that. I'll never hear the end of it now. But... She really is, and, uh, and I love her, and, and 48 years in it is not enough. I hope I get 48 more. Does that help at all? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me close this. Folks, we have to be committed to the Great Commission if we're going to be in God's will. We have to be committed to the Great Commandment if we're going to be in God's will. And we have to be committed to be united in prayer if we're going to be in God's will. How many people want to be in God's will? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are such an awesome God. And we certainly do not deserve the way you have blessed us and what you have done for us. Father, your word says in Luke 137 that for with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Father, I believe it because you said it, and that settles it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for loving us as we are. 
And my prayer is that each of us will reflect you more and more each day until that day we come to meet you face to face. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.